lot in calculus, and that's why I'm, I'm reviewing them. Because see, I'm trying to right now. I'm trying to work out these hydrological equations, where I can prove, you know, to show that you cannot possibly hold back a body of water the volume that Lake Missoula was presumed to be by a seal composed of glacial ice. You absolutely couldn't do it. It's impossible. The problem is, you know, it's sort of like the global warming thing. Once you acknowledge that the whole basis of the idea doesn't make sense, they've, got, they've erected this whole superstructure on the idea that anthropogenic warming is the sole cause of climate change, which of course there's many variables and many factors, and while the human contribu contribution is a, certainly a small factor, it is probably one of the most trivial factors compared to other things, like changing geometries of the of orbital geometries, changes in solar radiation, changes in the optical density of the atmosphere, changes in CO2 output from the oceans. I mean, we could start with a list going right down the line, and probably every one of those is more significant or no less significant than anthropogenic warming. But the idea of the flood out in, in the Pacific Northwest is similar, in that it's predicated upon a model that doesn't make sense. Because if you abandon that model, what you're stuck with is something much, much bigger than the conventional dogmas permit. The conventional dogmas have that here's this lake held in by this ice dam, and it's just a bigger version of what you can go up to Iceland and see, or go over to British Columbia and see, or go up to Alaska and see, where you have these diminutive small little lakes that might have a volume of less than a thousandth of Lake Missoula, and yet somehow they can effectively breach the glacial dam that's holding them in and create a, a locally catastrophic flood. So what they do is they assume, well, we'll just imagine that since we've seen a lake held in by some ice up in British Columbia or down even in the Andes or wherever, we'll just imagine that we can extrapolate up by three orders of magnitude, and that can explain the Missoula flood. But see, once you realize that it make, that, that it's total nonsense, then what are you left with? See, every other possible mechanism, Earth-based mechanism, has essentially been ruled out. And here's what Brett's did. Brett spent 30 years building a, a case that was so ironclad that no matter what dogmas that the mainstream geologists invoked, they couldn't deal with this, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room was this, this evidence that Brett's had assembled. So what they finally did in order to somehow make that fit into their dogmas is they took this 800 pound gorilla and they dressed it up in this nice little, you know, pinky Lee suit and put a little cap on them and tried to make them look acceptable. But it's still a big 800 pound gorilla. And, and the problem is, see, is when you realize that that, that scenario that they've contrived makes absolutely no sense, then, then what do you do? Now you're stuck with this gigantic flood with, with peak flows of hundreds of millions, even billions of cubic feet per second, and, and absolutely no explanation. And see, the problem is they've gone halfway. By the 1960s, they had gone and acknowledged that, yes, there was a big flood. And here's how we explain it. So they can't backtrack on the flood now. The flood happened. Anybody can go out there and traverse this landscape for themselves, and they'll soon find out that, yep, they'll soon begin to get the eyes to see and understand, yes, I can see now what happens when a 1,000-foot tidal wave moves across the landscape. It can gouge out a channel 800 to 1,000 feet deep in a matter of, of days. It can strip away every single thing that existed there before it came so that there's nothing left. Well, anybody can see the effects. The effects, once you, once you begin to learn how to read the effects, they're indisputable. The problem is, is going from, okay, a recognition and an acknowledgement of the reality of these of floods of this scale to some kind of an explanation that makes sense. And like I've said repeatedly in, in these discussions we've been having over the last couple of years, the only thing that makes sense, well, there's nothing that makes sense unless your explanation, if your explanations are confined to purely terrestrial sources. But as soon as we expand our consciousness to include the cosmic domain,
yes, very, very plausibly, the cosmos has the kinds of energy or force inputs into the system that could result in that kind of an event. Because see, basically, what they, what they know, whether they admit it or not, is that they abandon the ice dam theory and thereby abandon a local explanation, they're suddenly confronted with something that in reality is global in scope and not local. But the current theory keeps it local. It keeps it in that box. So I'm out to demolish that theory. I'm out to show that, yeah, this Earth does get assaulted by cosmic forces, and it does it on a fairly regular basis, and it's done it repeatedly through the history of the Earth. And if we want to have a future, that is what we better be reckoning with. Well, the thing about the Iceland example is, and if you look at the Iceland example, it actually refutes the Missoula flood example. Well, that's what I'm getting at. I, I, I brought this question up to one of the help ge geologist helpers on this field trip that, that me and Brad went on last summer out there. You know, we, when we went out there in August, we, we signed up for a field trip sponsored by the Ice Age Floods Institute and uh, led by three geologists, all who had done work or written papers or done some, some work on, on the the flood effects out there. The leader of it has written a, actually a very beautiful book on it. I had a brief discussion with a number of these people about stuff. Um, one of the things is when I mentioned the fact of the, the, the difficulty of having glacial ice hold back that much water, uh, one of the assistants' responses to me was, well, you got to bear in mind that the, that the ice dam was 30 miles thick. And you're like, oh, oh, well, you've got me on that one. Well, if you look in Iceland, and I don't know how to pronounce the Icelandic term for the, for the name of the volcano, but there is a large ice sheet. In fact, I'm putting this into my updated program I'm putting together solely on climate change. There is a large glacier up there with a volcano under it. That volcano just so happens to be 30 miles from the perimeter of the ice sheet. Now. That volcano, about every 20 or 30 years, it erupts. Okay, when it erupts, it creates a subglacial reservoir of meltwater. The volume of that meltwater is, constitutes some of the biggest outburst floods documented in the modern record. That flood is the one that I used to get, when I mentioned earlier, three orders of magnitude. In other words, the largest known modern outburst flood that's been documented was less than a thousandth of the volume flowing out of the <coughs> Lake Missoula area. That was this, these, they're called Jokalaups, Icelandic term for outburst flood. So you got this volcanic eruption that occurs under the ice, it melts this reservoir of water, the, the size of the, the reservoir of water again is less than a thousandth that of Lake Missoula, and it takes approximately two to three weeks for that volume of water to migrate through the 30 miles of ice separating it from the perimeter and then it bursts out and creates this Yokolops or outburst flood. Now what that shows me is that even a very small volume of water under a very small pressure can quickly move through glacial ice. Now the scale invariant part, when you're talking about, Jerry, scaling up from that, well, here, here's the problem. You've got a picture. Everybody knows how you've got concrete reinforced dams. Charles, you probably know something about it. Concrete reinforced steel, very thick at the base. Uh, steel uh, pins going into the bedrock. Bedrock grouting. You know what the purpose of bedrock grouting is? What that means? No, bedrock yes. grouting. You know what it is, right, Sam? When you inject grout, a slurry, a cement slurry into the bedrock to fill up every pore in the bedrock, creating a curtain, what's called a grout curtain, under the dam. That keeps it, water from going through it. Right, and because you can't, have, you can't have the slightest trickle going through. That's right. Because what will happen is it'll, that slight trickle will slowly enlarge the conduit until it reaches some critical threshold. Once it's breached that critical threshold, the water flowing through there begins to quickly erode away the walls of the conduit. Okay, now, we've got this dam of glacial ice. 
Now picture you've got a valley. It's got a flat floor that's two miles across, and the bottom of that floor is unconsolidated sediment several thousand feet thick. Not rock, sediment. Then the valley comes up mountainsides on both sides, and at 2,100 feet up off the valley floor, the valley is seven miles wide. So picture it's seven miles wide at 2,100 feet up from the valley floor, comes down into the bottom of the flat valley floor, it's two miles wide. Now think about the, what's the biggest dam in North America, concrete reinforced dam, the most massive. Grand Coulee, it's one mile wide, 400 feet high, say 400 feet high, one mile wide. Hoover's not bigger than that. What? Hoover's not bigger Hoover's than that. taller, but it's two, Hoover it's is wide. over 700 feet high. Okay. And again, Hoover, like Grand Coulee, is anchored directly into the bedrock itself. Okay. Now you've got Hoover, the tallest dam in the U.S., holds back a pressure head of maybe 600 feet of water. Maybe a little more. They don't fill it up the reservoir all the way up to the top of the dam. Grand Coulee is 400 feet high, and its pressure head of water is going to be less than that, 300 and something. But my point is, is when we see a, a, a con an engineered concrete steel reinforced dam, 700 feet of Hoover Dam, I believe, is the tallest dam in the U.S. Okay, which probably has the highest pressure behind it because of the depth. And Grand Coulee is, you know, a mile wide. Okay, so now compare the size of Grand Coulee to this valley, the profile I'm talking about. We're seven miles <coughs> wide. Now, when I say 2,100 feet, the reason I say 2,100 feet is because that's where the high water mark is. In, inside the reservoir, the high water mark is 2,100 feet above the valley floor. So you've got to create a, a completely impermeable seal. That's 1,000 PSI. Pressure. That's right. It's al almost a thousand psi at, at the bottom. You have to bear in mind now. Glacial ice is not a solid impermeable mass. You go, you go and read about the the anatomy of glaciers. What you'll discover is they've got crevices, they've got fractures all through them. They've got tunnels with water flow. They've got rivers that flow through them. There's intercrystalline <coughs> water flow that flows through the, the crystals of ice. Now. If you look at modern glacial dams, what you find out is that there's no example of a modern glacial dam that has held back water more than two to three hundred feet tops. Most of them fail when the water gets to be about a hundred feet deep, 150 feet deep. But out there in Montana, what they're saying is that there was a glacial dam that held back 2,100 feet of water across this valley with a seven foot span at the at the water level. Seven, mile. seven mile span, a seven mile span. Now how plausible is that? And it did it fifty times? And it's a, it's a supposedly, well according to the latest theories, it has it did that up to eighty times. So the dam gives way, the water all drains out, all five hundred and fifty cubic miles of water drains out of these mountain valleys, and then somehow the ice comes back out of Canada reseals the valley, refills this lake with another 500 cubic miles of water. Now meanwhile, while all this is going on 50 or 60 or 80 times, all the rest of the ice complex in North America is disappearing and melting back. But some it, it, diminishing in height, it's diminishing, its margin is going back. So, but somehow, out there in this area of northern Idaho and western Montana, the ice is able to come back and keep resealing this valley so that you can repeatedly have these floods. But you can see what, what it reminds me of is if you read about the old Ptolemaic model of the solar system. Remember what the Ptolemaic model was? In, in Ptolemy's model, the Earth was at the center. And as long as your observations weren't too precise, you could almost believe it. And for, you know, a thousand years or more, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was considered sacrosanct. Earth was at the center, the sun went around the earth. What happens then is that eventually Kepler and Tycho Brahe and Galileo come along, Copernicus, present the data that totally refutes it. But what happened was, in the interim, as the observational science got better, they would go out and they would go, wait a second, okay, if 
it's perfectly circular. See, in the Ptolemaic model, Earth is at the center, and everything else is in perfect circles. In the real model, Sun is at the center, and the orbits are elliptical. So the problem was, is with the improvements in observation, there become more and more discrepancies between the theoretical model and the real world observations. So in order to explain those real world observations, what they would do is they would introduce efferents and cycles and epicycles within the greater until finally it became so complicated with these cycles within cycles within cycles that Mars was coming up and then it was doing this and then it was doing that and it got so complicated that almost nobody could understand it anymore. And then of course here comes Kepler along and what he does is he does some eth elegant mathematical calculations that shows that the observations doesn't fit Earth at center with circular orbits, it fits Sun at center with elliptical orbits. And all of this complexity just basically disappears with just a new theoretical approach. Well, all the theorizing about the Missoula flood is sort of like that Ptolemaic, see, because one flood couldn't explain the, the vast complexity of this phenomena that's preserved out there. So then they had to go to two floods, and then five floods, and then seven floods, and then 40 floods, and now it's up to 80 floods. Because the, the, the effects of it are on such a vast scale that there's no way they can say, okay, all that water came out of this one outlet of this lake, and it caused all of this stuff. Well, it could was impossible to have that only happen once. So what they've done is they've kept adding and adding and adding to where now it's like 80 floods required to do it. Well, like Ptolemy's theory of the solar system, it's just gotten to the point where it's so unwieldy, it's time to just replace it with a much more elegant theory. It's an elliptical flood. Yes, the theory is that, um, <laughs> see, and all of the critics of Brett's all rejected his idea of a flood because they said, well, there's no force. We don't know of any force. There's no volcanoes up there. We don't, there's no forces that could cause the kind of, see, because Brett's originally invoked glacial melting. And that's what he attributed it to for 20 years. Before, between the early 1920s and the 1940s, Brett's, in all of his papers, attributed it to some accelerated glacial melting. Then Pardee comes along in the 40s and says, oh, there was this big lake in western Montana. It drained out. Now geologists who had rejected, who wouldn't even consider, wouldn't even go look at the evidence that Bretz was documenting in the field, said, hmm, a glacial lake. Well, there are modern glacial lakes. Ah, this fits the criterion of uniformitarianism. The present is the key to the past, and this is the cornerstone of our geological religion, is that we only can interpret things from the past according to things we see going on right now. And if it's not going on right now, it never happened. That was, per, that was the prevailing dogma for 100 years. Well, Bretz's ideas went so completely counter to that, but with the introduction of the idea of a glacially damned lake, the uniformitarians could now go, Oh, well, okay, it's just a bigger version of something that we see going on in the world today. Case settled. No mystery anymore. And that's essentially where it stands. But I can already see the breaches. The dam is beginning to crack. The water is starting to come out of these cracks, and it's gaining force. And I'm going to go up there with a little stick of dynamite and see if I can't accelerate the process.